Interstate 75 runs through central Florida, a route for millions of tourists each year. Eileen Warnos, who is better known as Lee, was just a drifter of 16 when she first came down to Daytona Beach. The I-75 was a highway Lee Warnos knew well. She worked it as a prostitute, hitching rides from exit to exit. She claimed to have had thousands of men over the years. Then between 1989 and 1990, she murdered seven men. The FBI labeled Lee Warnos America's first female serial killer. And since then, the book and movie deals poured in. Lee Warnos' girlfriend, Tyria Moore, once a prime suspect herself, was not charged. Before their arrest, police were hunting for two women, popularly referred to as the angels of death. Serial killing seemed to have become a brutal fact of life. Tragically, they happen so often, they sometimes take on a horrible familiarity. But there's one string of murders unlike any you've ever heard about. <laughs> First there was Ted Bundy, then the Gainesville murders. And now Central Florida is being threatened with news of yet another round of serial killings. Eight men have been shot to death in cold blood on Central Florida highways, including the busy tourist route of I-75. But this time there's an even more chilling twist to the slayings. Police say for the first time in criminal history, these killers may be murdering with a feminine touch. The main suspects are two young women who play damsels in distress along the roadway. On January the 9th, 1991, Lee Warnos was arrested at the last resort biker bar in Daytona Beach. This is the original police video of Lee Warnos confessing to the murder of seven men. Tyria Moore, her girlfriend, was not charged. Hi, boys and girls. This is Steve Glazer, Lee's uh, lawyer. When I was a child, I was abused by my parents, and I developed an imaginary friend, and I built him. <laughs> now, Lothar is the protection that I don't have. My dog died, so I keep Lothar out here to keep the, the drug addicts away from the house. And did you, you made Lothar yourself? Made him out of my own. I made him out of my own two hands. <laughs> I built him. Steve and Lothar lived in a teepee together for several years. Let's see. This is Steve's office. Before he became a lawyer, Steve worked as a musician. He once opened for Leon Redbone. We're driving with Steve to meet Arlene Prali, who adopted Lee Warnos last year. Arlene, a born-again Christian, lives on this 35-acre horse farm, where she breeds Tennessee Walker horses Wolves. Oh, she breeds wolves too. Yeah. My main problem so far is that Steve and Arlene have told me that Lee wants $25,000 for the interview. I'd always thought that the son of Sam Law prevented people Good. from profiting from their crimes, right. but apparently the son of Sam isn't in effect anymore. <laughs> Last year, yeah. Arlene employed Steve to handle her adoption of Lee Warnos. Nick Bromfield? Hi, Nick. Hi, Very pleased Hi, to meet with you. I miss Steve. Arlene Braley? Yeah. 
Do you know she has our name? She her legal name, name is Eileen Carol Warnes Fraley. Oh, really? Because mm -hmm. you adopted her, right? And changed her name. There must be a real bond between... How, how were you aware that there was such a strong bond between you? What made you first feel that? I, it's a neat story, but I can't tell you. But the one thing I can tell you is our in-laws have since... Arlene was refusing to talk myself. until her daughter Lee got paid Fine. the $25,000. My husband and myself, yes. That was okay to say, right? But as far as me and Lee and how we got together, no, I just, I can't, I can't start it. Because you see, I get so excited when I talk about it that I'll start heading just into one hurdle, which Steve would say, okay, you could go over one hurdle, but then I can't stop. It's like a horse that loves to jump. And when I talk about her, I just, I love her and I keep going. I told you, it's a, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating story because of the way all the characters in the play here are just so very interesting. It's, uh, you know. My doctor in Gainesville would probably even be willing for you to interview him. He is a surgeon. And um, when I had my accident last year on April the 14th, it was horrible. I mean, I got kicked in the back. It lacerated my liver and broke three ribs. They thought I was going to die. And my doctor said it was the love of God going through me as a channel toward Eileen Warnes that saved my life. They said I was going to die, but the love that I had so much for her and knew she couldn't be alone pulled me through. They all said I was going to die. They beat my husband. He was out in Las Vegas at a convention, and I pulled through. So, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to this that just, it's, like he says, fascinating. So the next stage is really to come up with a counteroffer. No, the next stage is to come up with $25,000. Right. Well, we but, okay, okay. Well, then, the, then, well, then do if you don't, then the next thing to do is to really get a counteroffer and let's, if, and let's and tell we'll her something. And express it okay? out to her today. Because this way, like I told you before you left, I said, that, you know, when you, when you, please don't come here with the understanding. I was perfectly honest with you. Don't come here with the understanding that she'll even talk with, with you without paying. I told you that. Okay, and so we would basically then pay the money to, well, we'd pay the money to you or to, as, as, as her league or... As her mom, and then um, Steve gets a percentage as our agent. Right. Very Everybody's... tiny percentage. This poor man works for nothing. In fact, Arlene and Lee's relationship is extremely well documented, and it seemed far cheaper at this stage to buy in some local TV footage. Levy County horse farm owner Arlene Prowley has come to the aid of accused serial murderer Eileen Wernos. Prowley says she and Wernos speak on the phone to each other frequently. We have become super good friends ever since then. She is a beautiful woman. She is not at all like the media has portrayed her to be. She is very kind, compassionate. Um, she's got a heart of gold. This Thanksgiving should be a special one for the Prowley family because this year they hope to be with their newly adopted daughter. But she isn't a newborn. She's 35-year-old Eileen Warnos. Her eyes, there was just something about her eyes that, before we ever knew her, there was something that deep within me said she is not capable of doing what they are accusing her of doing. Over the next few weeks, a strange friendship blossomed, with both women exchanging daily letters, phone calls, and even poetry. In one poem, Aileen wrote, You are way too kind to get to know my kind of mind. I felt like I had known this person forever. And that was the weirdest feeling to me because I've never, I've never experienced that before. There are times when I'm there and she's so sad. And I know if I could just hold her and pray over her, it would pick her up, it would make her feel better, it would give her hope. And to not be able to do that at this point, it's about driving me nuts. I know that it's not motivated by anything like greed or self-betterment uh, or improvement or anything like that. I know this is a religious, spiritual uh, desire th and that Arlene and Robert are going to undertake. Prawley says she's not interested in any book or movie deals, and her only motivation for this adoption is good old-fashioned Christian love and the desire to have a family after all these years. While we were waiting for Steve and Arlene to hear back from Lee Warnos, we traveled to Daytona Beach, where Lee Warnos had last lived. Police divers recovered the 22 caliber pistol that Lee Warnos had used in all seven murders from Miss Lagoon in Daytona Beach. 
Lee lived here with Tyria Moore, her lover for over five years, a woman she referred to as her wife and whom she was desperately in love with. They lived together at this motel, the Fairview, and it was here that Lee Warnos and Tyria Moore first saw the police composites themselves. Witnesses claimed to have seen them driving one of the murder victim's cars. Tyria Moore fled to her family's home in Ohio, leaving Lee and eventually betraying Lee and testifying against her in court. Lee Warnos was charged with all seven murders. Tyria Moore became the main police witness against her. This is Lee Warnos as she was first being charged. A prostitute from the age of 14, Lee had a long history of neglect and sexual abuse. Lee was born in 1956 in Troy, Michigan. Three months later, she was abandoned by her mother. In 1963, her father committed suicide in prison. He was serving a sentence for sodomizing a seven-year-old child. Taria Moore represented the most stable relationship in her do life. Do you understand the nature of the charge? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do, sir. Do you wish to be represented by counsel? Yes, I do. Can you afford to hire an attorney? No, sir. Do you work? No. Uh, I'm in um, jail. How can I work? <laughs> well, obviously you're not working now, but how long has it been since you've last worked? Oh, about... Uh, oh. oh, 84, possibly. You hadn't worked in six or seven years? How do you, how do you support yourself? I'm a professional call girl. Do you own any property here in the mm -hmm. state of Florida? You own a motor vehicle of any kind? Pardon? You own a motor vehicle of any kind? No, sir. If you'll sign an affidavit, I will appoint the public defender to represent you. And Ms. Warner, you've been ordering this warrant to be held without bail. That will be my order. The press reported that Lee Warnus's favorite hangout was the last resort, a biker bar near the Fairview, where she was arrested by the police on her last oh, day of wow. freedom. This could be fun. Yeah. We were looking for someone called, uh, uh, is, is it called Cannonball or something? I guess I was wrong. I hope you don't know. Uh, yeah, we were looking for someone Cannonball. called Cannonball. CB. Right. Hi, how do you do? All right. Hi, how do you do? Uh, so did you, did you actually know Lee well, or not particularly? As, as well as, as well as a bartender knows an occasional, you know, she only come in here like maybe a half a dozen times. Uh, you know, she wasn't really a regular customer, a real frequent. She you was, uh, well, she used, she didn't have no transportation. And when she would walk back to where she lived, down the road down here, this was on the side of the road, so she'd just stop by. I see. And then she got drunk down there the night before. She got um, arrested, and uh, she came down here, and she slept on that seat for a little while. On oh, that uh, seat, seat there. Yeah. yeah. And she was just here when I got here the next morning. But as far as knowing anything about her personality or anything, I don't really know anything. And she was, she was a flat cracker, you know, so nobody in here tried to pick her up. Flat cracker. Flat cracker. A lesbian. Cannonball told us to come back the following day when the human bomb was performing. Someone who reportedly knew Lee well. We went to visit Dick Mills, who we'd heard of from various tabloid accounts of his sex romps with a serial killer. Dick Mills spent a week with Lee just before her arrest. 
He picked her up at Wet Willie's bar. Lee was heartbroken. The police search was on and Taria had just left her. Oh, hi. I don't do not yet. This is that paper you're talking about? Yeah, it's called it's uh, and it's called My Sex Run with Kinky Man Killer. That's what the article's called. All I want to know is who's the best lawyer right there, man, to sue them for this trash? Who can never I talked quote, that shit? Can I quote you a, a bit? If you said this, right? Can I quote you a bit? Well, you read okay, what says, it is you want, want to say. It says, quote. she stayed at my place for five days. At first, she seemed perfectly normal. But after a while, she began making some really weird confessions. We were lying in, uh, we were lying in bed one night when she started talking about her favorite sexual fantasies. She said she often got turned on by imagining she had a black hood over her head and was tied to a tree in a forest. Then a guy would come up, rape her, and shoot her in the head. She said the actual killing would make her climax. I was real sickened by what she said. Wrong. Wrong. There's partial truth to that, but most of that, I don't know where it came from or who got it or nothing about it. And you can check any film anywhere in the country or anybody that's got it, and I've never said that. Okay? It goes along the lines that uh, she told me one time that the idea was that she'd like to lay in bed out in the middle of the forest, the woods, or somewhere in the mountains, or something, have a hood over her head or something, and somebody crawled in through the window of this side. No, they had the hood on or something, and would rape her or this and that kind of shit, and she liked that. I mean, as far you, as all these other things go did, pertaining to did, her, did, there's did no reality to it. Did you feeling that she hated men, or...? No, I just got the feeling she's what she was, a dyke, except I didn't know she was a killer. There's no way I could I know mean, that. Could, but, I mean, could you tell that when you made love to her, or...? Nah, not particularly. She just probably liked it either way, whatever came along. Didn't really seem to matter much. It's just another bad experience, I'm sure, for both of us. But that is a bunch of garbage. I, like I say, why don't you ask them where they got the bullshit from? That's what I, you know, I'm more amused than that. Who told them, you know, who told them the lies? Or authorized them to write lies? Can't, aren't they capable of telling the truth? I know, I guess the truth doesn't sell many newspapers sometimes. But she couldn't have always hated men. I mean, it sounded as though you had some kind of a relationship. I don't know. It was just that we're two lonely, desperate people in a bad situation, but except for the killing factors I didn't know about. And so it's just two people getting along for a little while, you know. I don't, don't really know how to explain that. But it's, I mean, when you made love to her, did you, you couldn't have felt that she hated men. She's been I never really, sort of I, ne I never really gave it much thought one way or the other. Just, I don't know, whatever turned her on at the moment, or whatever she could get away with, I guess. But uh, from everything I've heard and read and seen since, not pertaining to this, I'm talking about what's been on TV. Well, why do you think thing. she didn't kill you as well? You have to ask her that. Well, why do you? What's your feeling? Oh, you... uh, just maybe, maybe one possibility. I don't know what this other woman looked like, but. I might have resembled her. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, or she might resemble me. You mean her lover? And maybe it was just a mental thing with her. Yeah, this woman she's her living lover. with. Yeah, her lover, whoever it is. All I ever heard was tie somebody. I don't know anything else. So if you want any answers to those questions, you'll have to ask those people, whether it be the Thai character or whether it be uh, Aileen or so, Eileen, Eileen, whatever her name is herself. Before she received her first death sentence, Lee planned to live in this cottage on Arlene's ranch and help her to breed horses. Arlene also raises wolves. She believes they represent an important part of our spiritual lives, all too often forgotten today. We've been in Florida a week now and nothing had been heard from Lee. Arlene always maintained that she and Lee had a very close relationship, but something was obviously wrong. Arlene now seemed to be negotiating her own personal appearance fee, entirely separate from Lee's. She quoted the Montel Williams show as paying $10,000. But how much do you think you want if we don't have Lee in the film? You talk to Steve. I've never done this before. I said to Steve, well, you're not my criminal lawyer, so can you be my agent? And he said, yes. 
Keith, they just have the grip to call me. I've never done this before. What do you think might be a fair price? I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I've never done this. I have never done this before. But you could talk to Steve. I mean, do you think it'd be less than that? Yeah, I, honestly, I don't know. It depends how much you talk to Steve. How many days you want to be here? What you want to see? Do you want the tapes? Do you want everything? The new stuff? Um, all of the personal, the poems, the letters, the the artwork. I mean, it, I'm sure he'll write up some kind of contract. For this you get this, and for this you get everything. Mm. Talk to him. He's my agent. <laughs> An agent. Do you believe this? Oh. Arlene adopted Lee just before her first trial for the murder of Richard Mallory. At this stage, her lawyer was Trish Jenkins, a public defender who has been criticized for failing to bring to the court's attention the fact that Mallory had previously served a 10-year sentence for attempted rape. Many think it was Mallory's alleged rape of Lee that started her off on her killings. He put the cord around my neck and he said, yes, you are, bitch. He said, you're going to do everything I tell you to do. And if you don't, I'll kill you right now. And I'll fuck you after. Like, just like the other sluts have done. And, um, then he said, it doesn't matter to me. Their body, your body will still be warm for my huge cock. And he said, he was choking me, and I was holding it like this. And he said, do you want to die, slut? And I just nodded no. And then he said, are you going you gonna to listen to everything I've got to say? Have you do? And I just nodded yes. And he told me to lay down on the car seat. OK, what happened next? <sighs> then he decided. He began to start having uh, anal sex. Okay. And he's doing this very violent manner, movement. And then he, I don't know if he came or what he, um, Climax. I, I talk street talk, so so I don't know if he did that. <clears throat> and he violently took himself out and violently put himself in my vagina. Were you saying anything to him at that point? No, I was crying my brains out. Okay, they want to. All right, so. Uh, takes the visine and he lifts up my legs and he puts what turns out to be rubbing alcohol in the visine bottle and he sticks some up my rectum area <laughs> and that really hurt pretty bad because he tore me up for a while. And then he put some in my vagina, which really hurt bad. And then he walked around to back to driver's seat side, and he pulled my nose open like this. Pulled them open, and he squirt rubbing alcohol down my nose. And he said, I'm saving your eyes for the grand finale. And he put the visine back on the dash. And I was really pissed. And I was just, I didn't care. I was yelling at him and everything else. He was laughing away, saying, that's what I want to hear. I heard it when you start crying and all that pain. I thought to myself, I got to fight. I'm going to die. This guy is going to play with me and play with me, and then he's going to kill me. He's already said he's going to kill me. He's, he's already said he killed other girls. <coughs> I got to fight. I jumped up real fast, and I spit in his face. And he said, you're a dead bitch, you're dead. And he's wiping his eyes. 
And I laid down real quick and I grabbed my bag. And he was starting to come for, for me. And I grabbed my bag and threw, whipped my pistol out toward him. And he was coming toward me with his right arm, I believe. And I shot immediately. And I think I shot twice, as fast as I could. Lee had expected to be acquitted. But then Judge Blunt took the unusual move of allowing evidence of the other six murders to be presented. Until by warrant of the governor of the state of Florida, you, Eileen Carroll Warnus, be electrocuted until you are dead. And may God have mercy upon your course. Scumbags of America. <clears throat> Most of us will probably never worry about spending time in jail, but if you are ever involved in the criminal justice system, you will need a lawyer who can explain the system to you. In a completely unexpected legal move, Lee, with Arlene's help, decided to hire Steve to defend her on the next three murder charges and to fire her public defender, Trish Jenkins. Steve attracted enormous media attention when he entered a guilty or no contest plea to the next three murders. The born-again Arlene Prowley believed Lee should come clean and confess yeah, her sins. As Aileen Warnos was led from Marion County Jail, she gave no indication that she would plead no contest to three murder charges, instead talking about dropping her public defenders and hiring private attorney Steve Glazer. But only seconds after being named her attorney, Glazer surprised everyone and told the court that Warnos wanted to change her plea. With her adoptive mother watching on, the nation's first known serial killer pleaded no contest to killing Dick Humphreys and Troy Burris in Marion County David Spears in Citrus County. Legally, the no contest plea is viewed as a guilty plea, and because there is no plea agreement, Werno still faces the death penalty in each case, an unusual legal prospect that Judge Thomas Swaya was obviously aware of as he carefully questioned Wernos about her decision. God has forgiven her for what she's done, and our state has the death penalty, so why not go for it? I mean, wow, she could be home with Jesus in a matter of a few years. The theory of, and the philosophy of Jesus Christ, if you are going to... Uh, believe that you're saved by Jesus Christ, the first thing you have to do is confess. Confess your sins, and, and, and be, that's between her and God, and that's what she's doing here. She'd be much better off in heaven. I mean, if I had the choice, I'd rather be up there, but God has not chosen for me to go, but I mean, Lee has an open door here. I have made peace with my Lord, and I have asked forgiveness. I am sorry that my acts of self-defense ended up in court like this, but I take full responsibility for my actions. It was them or me. I am sorry for all the pain that my actions have caused. I am prepared to die if you say it is necessary. But I am not afraid By pleading guilty, it appeared that Lee Warnos was in reality hoping for mercy and forgiveness, but that is not what happened. I sentence you in case number 91-463 to death for the murder of Troy Burris. Case number 91-304. I sentence you to death for the murder of Charles Humphreys. Case number 91-112, Citrus County case number. I sentence you to death for the murder of David Spears. Thank you. And uh, probably see, uh, I'll be up in heaven while y'all are rotting in hell. Okay, there will be an automatic appeal. You have the right to an appeal. Mr. Glazer, is that going to be handled by you May or the public defender? your wife and kids uh, get raped. I would ask that uh, you would appoint right the public the defender's ass. office. Okay, I'll, the I'll appoint the public defender's office uh, to handle the appeal. There's one other thing that I want to say that I think needs to be said. I know I was raped. You weren't nothing but a bunch of scum. Therefore, these proceedings are now Putting completed. Putting somebody who was raped right, to please. death? Or or fuck fuck Steve played this song to Lee after she received the death sentences. Just before they serve him one last meal, shave his head, then tell him how he feels. The warden comes to say goodbye. Reporters come to watch him die. Watch him as he's strapped into the chair. Have you seen the Iron Lady's charms? Legs of steel, leather on her arms. Strapping on a man's 
to die, alive for life, an eye for an eye, and death's the iron lady in the chair. I haven't seen that in a long time. I'll do it again later, but uh, I just haven't seen it in a long, long time. What does Jay think of that song? I gave her a copy of it, and I sang it for her. In, uh, the, in, I didn't have my guitar, but I sang it for her in the cell, and, and, she, and she, she enjoyed it, especially the part about, uh, in the courtroom, watch the balance of the scales. If the price is right, there's time for more appeals. The strings are pulled, the switch is stayed, the finest lawyer's fees are paid, and a rich man's never died upon the chair. We traveled down to visit Lee at this maximum security prison on the edge of the Everglades, a seven-hour trip from Gainesville, where Steve and Arlene lived. I learned that Lee was now enormously depressed. She desperately missed Tyria and barely communicated with anyone. Arlene and Steve still hadn't heard from Lee since we'd first arrived in Florida over two weeks ago, and I realized their relationship with Lee was not as close as I had first thought. Lee is living in a six by eight cell on death row. We had arranged through the superintendent to meet her at the prison chapel. Um, I'm Lieutenant Dodrell, and we were just trying to get um, inmate Warnos. We told her that you were here, and she's refusing a uh, visit. She's refusing a visit? I just told her that, I just told the officer in confinement to get it in writing. So she, we have it written, we're gonna get it in writing. I can't she's believe refusing. this. She says, um, Something about her laundry is not back and she doesn't want to wear a dress and she's just being rocked. She doesn't have to wear a dress. But she, she won't get dressed proper to she go She won't to get dressed. Yeah, so. It's ridiculous because we've come all the way down from Gainesville. Yeah. I know, uh, every time we ask her, you know, she's just really un uncooperative. She, she's just, you know, we can't force her to do it. So. But, she's, but I am getting her to write it in writing so that I won't get in trouble for not having you visit. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hi. We were looking for you. You what? In this heat? Well, it's not that. <coughs> Why didn't you drive out? Because the gate was locked. Down the oh, it's just for the horses not to get out. Ah. So how did it go? Well. It's Rita rolled the ride. This is not good. I have more bumps. <laughs> this is terrible. She wouldn't. Uh, she wouldn't talk to us. She wouldn't see us. Why? No idea. She just wouldn't. She just didn't want to talk. Didn't want to say anything. Didn't want to communicate. So we didn't get anywhere. That's a shock. That's a total shock. Well, Steve's going Thursday, so go back with Steve. I mean, do you have any idea why she might not have wanted to... Arlene and Steve were still protesting that they didn't know what was wrong with Lee. They seemed unable to explain why they still hadn't heard from her. So in a sense, you know, now we're trying to find out from you what... <clears throat> the only thing I can think of is because I was honest with her and sort of disciplinarian that perhaps she was trying to punish both Steve and I you know, we lost the trial, and, and yet she's, she said, I want to die. How are you disciplinarian? I mean, what? I wrote letters, and I told her that she acted terrible in the courtroom, and that, you know, she better improve her behavior, and she would, I was is very that when she, in her. And, is that when she gave the judge the bird? Or? Yes, yes. And I wrote a very strong letter. <clears throat> I also told her I was sick of her doubting me and doubting Steve, that he was a very honest human being. He did just what she wanted, and because we lost, that was not his fault. Mm. So I feel, in a sense, that perhaps with the money, she knows the devastation financially that we are in, and she could help now. <clears throat> and this is her way of punishing me and punishing Steve by saying, well, good, we could get this money if I gave an interview. I'm not doing it. Why do you think she was so mad at both of you at the end of the last trial? Because we lost, because she has three death sentences. She said she wanted to die, but in her heart she wants to live. So you know how you say, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, feed me, but you really don't want to eat? That's basically it. I want to die, I want to die. But when she got the three death sentences, she was furious. That's why she gave him the bird. If it comes, it comes. And when it comes, it comes. Steve, though, was still insisting Lee wanted to die. His whole justification for entering a guilty plea for Lee was that she wanted to go to the chair. And you're sure she wants to go to the electric chair? 
yes, I'm sure. I'm sure that uh, in her anger and grief and torment, and the fact that it's very, very hard to live with the fa fact that she killed seven men, seven people, that she does want to die for it. She cried in the courtroom when she read her statement. She said, I'm not afraid to die, but if you feel it necessary to kill me, so be it. And as I told her from the beginning, I'll help her. I don't feel comfortable, but I'll sit there with her when they uh, strap her in. She, uh, she asked that I be there for her. She said, well, will you be there with me? And I said, Lee, you're allowed to have a lawyer and a, and a, a member of the clergy. If you want me there, I'll, I'll, I'll walk right up to there with you. And I'll be with you in the final moments. And I'll have to deal with the, I'll have to deal with uh, that pain later. I have spoken to several lawyers who have witnessed the execution of their clients, and they assured me it's something that they live with forever. It's nothing I look forward to, but as her friend, and I hope I'm becoming her friend, I would, I will be there for her, and I'll give her the advice that Woody Allen gave in his movie. I think it was Take the, I was, I don't remember the movie. It might have been Take the Money and Run. The lawyer's advice to the client who gets the electric chair is, don't sit down. They call this the death house. If Lee is electrocuted, she will be the first woman ever in the state of Florida to have gone to the chair. This is the cell that the inmate is kept in uh, up to seven days prior to his execution. About five o'clock in the morning, he's brought out where he is shaved, his head is shaved, and his right leg is shaved. And then he is brought through this door, which proceeds down a corridor, which goes to where the electric chair is. As he's going down the hallways, he's escorted by the assistant superintendent and the correctional officer chief, and is brought in here to the actual chamber. At this point, he is seated in the chair in front of the news media witnesses and the official witnesses who are already seated in the uh, witness area. He's brought in and put into the chair and the straps are placed around his chest and around his lap and on his arms. And then his legs are placed into these straps and secured there. After the inmate is secured in the chair, the superintendent will check the straps and ensure that they're all in place like they should be. He will then come over to the microphone that we have here in the witness in the chamber and remove the microphone and hold it up for the inmate to make a last statement to. He'll ask the inmate, do you have a last statement? And he will either sometimes say something or sometimes won't. After that is completed, the superintendent will go over to the telephone and check with the governor's office to see if there's any last minute stays. If he hears no last minute stays from the governor's office, the electrode then is placed on top of the inmate's head. It's an actual cap with an electrode inside is secured onto his head. One of these electrodes here is then fastened onto the top of the headpiece. Another device is placed around his calf, and the other electrode is placed onto that piece. After that is completed, the superintendent will make a motion to the executioner who is here inside the execution chamber where the executioner is. And he will nod to the executioner to go ahead and proceed with the execution. The executioner will throw a switch. The switch will start an automatic cycle, starting out at 2,400 volts at about eight amps. At this point, after they have seen that it has been carried out, they observe some tendencies of the inmate when the voltage hits him to tense up. It's almost simulating as if someone was lifting weights. And that's the only motion that you see out of the inmate, is just a, a tensing of the muscles. After that cycle is completed, there's two physicians who are sitting here in the chamber who come over and examine the body to see that if the inmate is in fact dead. It was 6 a.m. Steve was off to visit Lee and hopefully get us in the following day. Steve said it was a seven joint ride to the prison and he brought along a tape of his own music with him singing and playing all the instruments, especially for the occasion.
to you. All right. And uh, if I'm not out in three and a half hours, call the SWAT team. Bye. Steve was nervous. He hadn't talked to Lee for a month and didn't know how she wanted to plead at the next trial at Pasco County in five days' time. If Lee changed her plea to not guilty, Steve told us that he was going to have to resign from the case because he didn't have the necessary resources to fight it. I'd finally given in and paid Steve $10,000, a figure we'd settled on instead of the 25, apparently with Lee's consent. Suddenly this guard stepped out of the guardhouse and stopped us. The entire prison was locked down and we learnt we'd committed a major security violation by driving along the perimeter fence. You got a pocket knife? No. Just a shotgun, bazooka, dope. Two shoes. All right, here's the contract. I'll just uh, have her sign it. The trip to the prison had gone well. <laughs> Lee Warnos was going to keep to her no-contest guilty plea for the trial at Pasco the following week, and Steve and Arlene were to be paid $2,500 apiece. Yeah, clear as ice again. What's Davy Crockett doing on a $100 bill? Here I am paying Arlene her <laughs> money in advance <laughs> in exchange for a proper interview and additional What'd information. you say, uh, $1,000 on sunup in the fourth race at Belmont? <laughs> Steve then got concerned about his payment. She wants to know what? She wants to know when I was going to get paid. So I told her, you know, I, I trust her to, I trust you guys that you'll pay me when you, when are you going to pay me? When are we going to pay you? Yeah. Um, well, originally we were going to pay half the money up front. Oh, you want to just pay me all the way at the end? No problem with me. See, I have trust in my fellow person. $1,000 of the final payment was to go to Lee Warnos directly in prison. I had always thought the Son of Sam law would prevent this kind of payment, but Steve said Son of Sam isn't in effect anymore. And how did you first get to hear of her? I read about her in the newspaper. I saw her pictures in the paper, and my dad was in the hospital with a heart attack. And uh, my husband and I had nothing to do but read papers, and so we read the papers on her. And as soon as we saw the pictures in the paper, her eyes, I mean, I read people's eyes, and I just knew she was not capable of being a serial killer and doing what they said. So we prayed for two and a half weeks, and finally, at the end of two and a half weeks, we reached out to her through a letter, and I told her that um, she was going to think I was crazy, but that Jesus himself told me to write to her. And she said that when she first got arrested, she went and said, God, if you are real, send a Christian woman into my life to befriend me through this mess. So she got my letter, and I mean, it was just like instant explosion, like poof, here's this person. So that's how it started. And lots of phone calls later, and hundreds of letters later, and thousands of dollars of phone bills, here we are. Arlene believed Lee Warner should take the guilty no contest plea and confess her sins to Jesus. This is my favorite picture. This is of Stephen Lee in the courtroom after she came clean. See, uh, I mean, when she, how do you mean came clean? Pleaded no contest. The amazing thing about it is that, that you can see the look on her face. It's one of the few pictures that anyone has ever taken of her that show that she's you know, happy or content. This is almost like the first time she's actually, you know, I think she's relieved. If you look at her face there, she's actually smiling, relieved. Most of the pictures that uh, the press put in the newspaper are always the unflattering ones. Now that Lee had been paid, we returned to the prison the following day. Hi, we've come to try and uh, do uh, to to see Lee Warner. Let me Lee, hear you, sir. Lee Warner. Eileen, is that what you say? Yeah. Lee, Lee. Driver's license, please. I need your driver's license, his driver's license, and her driver's license, please. Oh, you need our driver's license, then? Yes, sir. Oh. Or take your ID. Okay. We're going to have to go back to the car and get them. You have to be Mr. Broomfield. That's right? right. Yeah, you were the one who was held hostage at the rear gate when I spoke to you. I was the one who was what? You were being held hostage at the rear gate, remember? 
Oh, we, we unfortunately drove you around... You called me. Yeah, we Tell photographed me. the institution and uh, right. got into a lot of trouble. I remember. And I Mr. need a picture ID or a driver's license. We waited for an hour for the prison escort to take us through. Then we heard Lee was again refusing to talk. Apparently, since Tyria betrayed her to the police, Lee just wanted to be left alone in her cell. There's been enormous public pressure to send her to the chair, and each county wants to be seen to be the one to do it. You don't want to be present for today's hearing. Because I'm tired of this re-election jazz. They're just trying to get promotional ladder climbing and political prestige from this. And I'm sick and tired of this. I'll probably get three more death row sentences. And then I got to go to Pasco and Dixon for two more de uh, death row. How many times you got to kill me? You know what I mean? This is, this is bullshit. They don't need to be doing this. Several of the victims' families have said they want to be present at the execution. Steve is even talking about selling the film rights off to the highest bidder to publicize the horrors of the chair. The people that did this just cannot imagine the grief, the hurt, the anguish that they have caused. This family, this is a man that I had for sure. I hope she meets up with, quote, old Sparky. You know who old Sparky is. And if the other lady so wishes, she can stand there and hold her head, as far as I'm concerned. People were also concerned that Tyria Moore, Lee's girlfriend, had not come forward earlier. And I feel like the other girl could have stopped some of them if she'd have come forward in time. She knew about them, some of them. But she didn't say anything. Maybe, save four men could have been saved. If she had, and she did not, and I don't Mrs. Prater's know why she... brother was the fourth victim. Lee, meanwhile, became increasingly withdrawn and hostile. I gladly don't want to be here. She doesn't want to be here. Okay, all right, uh, you don't have to be here, but let me give it some thought, and I'll decide where to. Okay. I don't care what the sentence is. I'm already on death row. I'm uh, going to see the chair. I don't, this is all re electional purposes. This is not for nothing but get you guys re elected. And this is a bunch of bullshit. This doesn't even need to happen. I'm trying to save taxpayers' money. You people don't care. You want to press on with the, with the jury and everything else to try to impress the public. And all I want to do is go back to prison, wait for the chair, and get the hell off this planet that's full of evil and your corruption in these courtrooms. It was in these woods that Lee Warnos claimed Richard Mallory raped and abused her. Many believed her testimony. But then what about the other six victims? We contacted the police who conducted the investigation. Trisha Jenkins, Lee's ex-public defender, the psychiatrist who examined her, and Tyria Moore, her lover, but all refused to talk. At her trial, Lee Warnos was medically described as a damaged and primitive child who sees the world as a place full of evil spirits and ghosts. She was described as having uncontrollable rages and temper tantrums and being too immature to properly grasp the finality of death. Mike Reynolds has just published a book on Warnos called Dead Ends. Well, Lee's life was, uh, this is pretty much, she had run out. As a prostitute, which she was never that uh, very successful with, she never put much effort into it. Lee never put much effort into her, her crimes either, it was crimes prior to that. Uh, she didn't have uh, much of a commodity out there. She was overweight, she was beery, she never dressed as a prostitute, never wore makeup. She wore cutoffs, sneakers, a camo t-shirt, and a cap and glasses standing on the side of the road. And her, and her hustle, as you look at her hustle, she wasn't soliciting. She would get in the car, engage the situation, say, I'm, uh, you know, these are my kids here, and show the photographs of the children, well, Lori Grody's children, his aunt's sister's children, and give them some song and dance story. I need some money, and, and, and I'll tell you what, I'll do this for you. You know, we could go over here in the woods and do this. It was, uh, she was running out of, she was running out of options. Oh, 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 yes, I'm a public defender. It was the night before the trial at Pasco County. 
Other lawyers were accusing Steve of greasing Lee's path to the electric chair and being unfit to represent her. They would turn their backs on Steve as he walked into the courthouse. There's no contest, please. Oh, 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 yes, I'm a public defender. Pretending that I'm doing well. When the rich make bail and the poor stay in jail, I wonder what I'm doing here. Steve still insists Lee wants to die. So why did she get so angry when she was sentenced? I mean, why did, why did she have the outburst that she had in court? Why did she give the judge the bird? Why, you know, why did she react to you and to Arlene in the way that she did after that sentence was passed? She, uh, maybe you, uh, you misunderstand what I have uh, no problems with Lee. Lee had no problems with me after that plea. Well, I thought she, there was a long time when <coughs> she didn't write to either of you. Or... No, we're, ta all right, we're talking on March 31st, she entered a change of plea. May 15th, uh, she was sentenced. Uh, May 15th till now is one. That's only it's, um, 30 days. And in that 30-day period, I have written to Lee twice and seen her. And I. But you just saw her. Yeah, I just saw her. We are finally about to see Lee Warnos on her way to court. All the press attention has made her into something of a star. Even before her arrest, up to 15 Hollywood movie companies were competing for her story. To date, Republic Pictures and CBS have produced a TV movie called Overkill, starring Gene Smart as Lee Warnos and there are two feature films being negotiated. There are also the chat shows, documentaries, and the books. The deal on On a Killing Day gives Arlene Crowley 33% on every paperback sold. Lee facing yet another death sentence seemed to be more upset about these deals than anything else. Yes, I'd like to say that public and to all the people of the world <clears throat> and to the news personnel that have been working on this these trials and these cases for the past 16 months that had stated defamations and mendacious lies of 98.6 percent magazines and news articles to uh, probably paid off by the cops to vile my character make me look like a monster and deranged or something like a Jeff Dahmer which I'm not uh, I intend to expose the crooked cops to the, to the people all over the world, not just America, not just Florida, all over the world before I die. And I also feel that uh, the movie Overkill, that is a total fictional lie, that they framed me as a first-time serial female serial killer for the title for that movie. For first female serial killer is not what I am, and I'm not even near it, and my confessions prove it, yet they did not, they have taken the confessions and gone 200% against what my confession stated to get their bogus movie out. And it stated self-defense, totally, which they hid from the jury at the Mallory trial, and they have, have hid from the public eye. Lee Warnos insists she's not a serial killer, that she did not stalk her victims or plan her crimes. As with the movie deals, Lee is also surrounded by a web of experts, all competing with her own theories on her behavior. Lee is portrayed as anything from a neglected and abused child who hates her father and is murdering him over and over again to a sadist who takes pleasure in the agony of her victims. Geneticists have asked for samples of Lee's body tissue, and there are plans to preserve Lee Warnos's brain for future experimentation. Sheriff Morland. We're chasing Sheriff Don Morland across the Marion County car park. Sheriff Morland has avoided our phone inquiries about three of his officers reportedly having had movie discussions with Hollywood a month prior to Lee's arrest. 
We've also contacted the Public Defender's Office, the State Attorney's Office, and the Public Prosecutor's Office, all of whom have refused to talk to us. We tried to get Sheriff Morland to speak, but all he did was to lock the door of this public building from the inside. The only person who would talk to us was Sergeant Brian Jarvis of the Marion County Police Force, who led the murder investigation. I asked him whether the case had caused his demotion. You were demoted into traffic. Right, I was actually transferred back into the, the patrol division. Uh, it had followed a month of uh, continual harassment on the job uh, in the current position I was in, which ultimately started when uh, Captain Vinegar had realized that I found out about their plan uh, to work with Tyria Moore in obtaining a uh, movie rights package. And who was Tyria Moore? Tyria Moore, uh, during the course of this investigation, she was uh, targeted as one of the two suspected killers of these men. And uh, there was a lot of... A state attorney's report found that three of Jarvis's fellow officers, Captain Vinegar, Sergeant Munster, and Major Dan Henry, were involved in movie discussions with Tyria Moore after Lee's arrest. Yeah, ultimately, when the, when the uh, arrest came, Lee Warnos was charged with the murder, and Tyria Moore was not charged with anything, but she was made a, uh, a state's witness, and she was working with these uh, fellow officers on obtaining uh, movie rights. I met her in a bar. The police had found Tyria in Ohio, where she agreed to set up her lover to confess. We were sitting on the floor watching TV, and she just come out and said, I have something to tell you. And I asked her what, and she said that she had shot and killed a man that day. She loved you, didn't she? Yes. She said she'd do anything for you, didn't she? Yes, she did. And in order for her to say what she wanted her to, you lied to her, right? Yes. With, in fact, much more than a couple of times, wasn't it? It could have been. Did you recall giving a deposition this morning? Yes, I did. Tyria Moore agreed with Sergeant Jarvis's superiors to help get Lee to confess. Tyria was brought back down to Marion County and housed in a motel. From the motel, Tyria Moore had a number of phone conversations with Lee, who at that time was held in custody in jail, but had not yet confessed to the murders. These conversations were monitored and made under police supervision. Hello? Hi? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hey. I don't know what the hell is going on, Lee. They've called. They've been up to my parents again. They've got my sister now asking her questions. I don't know what the hell is going on. Huh. What are they asking your sister questions about? I don't know. Hmm. If, Lee, they're, right. they're coming after me. I know they are. No, they're not. They're They've got to. They're, why are they asking so many questions then? Honey, listen. Listen, listen, do what you gotta do, okay? I'm gonna have to because I'm like gonna go to jail for something that you did. This is unfair. My family is a nervous wreck up there. My mom has been calling me all the time. She doesn't know what the hell's going on. Okay, you gotta do, okay? Alrighty. Uh, what? I'm not gonna let you go to jail. Okay? You evidently don't love me anymore. You don't trust me or anything. I mean, you're going to let me get in trouble for something that I didn't do. I said I'm not. Listen, quit crying. Listen. I can't help it. I'm scared shitless. I know. I love you a lot. I don't know whether I should keep on living or if I should... No, Ty, Ty, listen. What if they don't believe me? Ty, listen. What? I'm not going to let you go to jail. Listen, if I have to confess, I will. Yes. Why the hell did you do this? Why did you do this? I don't know. Listen, Ty. What? I'll probably never be able to see you. Yes. I love you. If I have to confess everything just to keep you from getting in trouble, I will. Okay. Don't worry, okay? Okay. I love you. No. Don't do it.
it now. Get it over with. Right this very moment? Yes. Get it over with. All right. Okay? Okay. You can right. call me it's back terrible. later. All right. All right. Okay, bye. At her confession, Lee repeated parts of the phone conversation with Ty and said it was because of Ty that she was confessing. Taria came from what police called a small town quintessential American family, something which Lee was greatly drawn to. something comes up with the Wernos case, we get affected. For example, in October, on October 31st, uh, just days after depositions had been taken on the case, I came home from work and went to my back door and noticed a note in the door. And the note- The back door here. The back door of my house, yes. And the note was stuck in the door and I read it and, and essentially it said, you know, keep your mouth shut unless you want your family to get hurt. And uh, I really didn't think too much of it at the time because you know, I've seen threats before, it's no big deal. But I turned it over to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement uh, just in the event that anything did happen. I wanted them to have it documented. Less than a month later, on November 25th, uh, my wife had gone out to the post office in the store uh, during the daylight hours, uh, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. When she came home, the house had been broken into, the doors were ajar. Uh, she went up to my office and all of the files on the Wernos case, on the, the uh, investigators and, and all the information I had had been trashed. Nothing else had been touched in the house. This is the note that was pinned to Brian Jarvis's back door. He suspects a burglary was connected with the Warnos case, but has been unable to prove who was responsible. I have no way to prove who broke into my house. I went to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. I went to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. I had hoped that I could get an, a, a good investigation done. Instead, uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement initially accused the media of breaking into my house to create a story. It was ridiculous. They refused to acknowledge the fact that, that there was something wrong here that they had to check into, and they refused to check into it. Uh, after accusing the media, they accused me of setting up the burglary. Totally ridiculous. They wouldn't... Brian Jarvis wouldn't now works as a private investigator in Tampa. He resigned from the police force. And I could see from that point on, you know, the state attorney's office wouldn't do anything in their investigation up in Ocala. FDLE wouldn't do their job down here. Uh, I wrote to the, the FBI. It took four months to get a reply from them. In the meantime, we were uh, literally awake for weeks at a time because we were afraid to go to sleep at night. And it just it really messed up our, uh, our whole lifestyle. You know, but just the thought that they were awake, uh, the evidence confronting Tyria Moore. She was in possession of property belonging to one of the murder victims, yet she was never charged with anything. She had been uh, seen when we had brought the composites around. A person in a convenience store said, I saw two people fitting those descriptions in here, and the date and time she gave was the same date and time that we narrowed Mr. Humphreys down to being there because we had found a receipt in his car. A statement was taken from her. It was never followed up on. She was never shown photographs of the girls. She was never followed up on in any manner. There is no evidence that Tyria Moore was involved in the killings. We talked to the clerk at the convenience store. She remembered seeing Tyria and Lee together, but refused to give us an interview. None of the witnesses attached to the case would talk to us. This man met Tyria Moore and Lee Warnos when they crashed a car in these woods belonging to Peter Sims, one of the murder victims. If y'all don't get in that van and get out of here, I'm gonna call the law. Well, we just wanted to ask about Lee Warnos and Tyria Moore at the truck stop. I don't want, I got nothing to say. 
I don't know if something happened with that car before or after or whatever. I don't know. Because there was a guy called Ray who fixed it, right? Yes. We tried to talk to him, but he seemed very frightened. <laughs> yes. What do you think? Why do you think he was frightened? I don't know. He might be scared that girl gonna get out of jail and get him next. I don't know. It was Tyria Moore driving the victim's car when it crashed. Lee Warnos has never implicated Tyria in the murders. In Tyria Moore, the mysterious Tyria Moore. Michael McCarthy is writing a book with Brian Jarvis, the uh, ex-policeman. I believe the person that she, as she perceived it, loved for the first time in her whole life and was willing to do whatever, under whatever circumstances, to provide what she probably had for the first time was like a nuclear family. She became a couple. She was the husband, quote unquote, and Tyria Moore was the wife, or at least that seems to be the setup. Out of that spirals a life of incredible resentment, frustration, and rage. And who does she kill? She kills her father over and over and over again. Uh, the police say we don't know how many men she killed. She kept killing the same guy. We don't know what triggered it off, but it wouldn't take a, 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 a Sigmund Freud to try to figure out the relationship between her and her father. And you look at these middle-aged, white men, sort of business types, who must have epitomized to her everything that she hated in this culture. I'd also learned to my horror that Arlene had written to Lee, saying that she didn't trust my eyes and Lee should be very careful in dealing with us. Arlene herself hadn't visited Lee now for over two months and had said in an unguarded moment that she wished she'd never heard of Arlene Warnos. Very quietly, we have, turn the cameras off. We have and leave. paid you half your money. I did not get anything, and this has you nothing. Got 12, this we has got nothing. Twelve hundred and fifty dollars uh -uh. from no, us the last listen time. Listen to me. This has nothing to do with money. This has to do with trespassing and invasion of my privacy. I'm asking you to turn the cameras this off has to do and with, leave until Steve comes. This has to do comes. with reneging on a deal that you made. I said I would and speak a with you. And that you have signed. Yes. Stephen Glazier would be here. I do not see Mr. Glazier's body anywhere on the premises. Mr. Glazier is not written into the contract. The only time we can film you is with Mr. Glazier. Is that, it? No, but it also is not in the contract that this 27th or 8th day of June that I have to speak alone. I said we I would We arranged talk. that we would see you on Sunday. Correct, with Mr. Right. Glazier. Not and with I Mr. Would, Glazier. That yes. was your arrangement with Mr. Glazier. It's nothing to do with us. Rita, I'm asking We've you for been the here third now time for four to turn weeks. off the camera. We've been here now for four weeks. Originally, we were going to see Lee the first week. Look, at, legally, I have a right to tell you you're trespassing. Now, I will talk to you with my attorney, period. I don't like coming home I think home you're from a, a very, home. very deceptive person. Well, that's fine. And I think you've been playing games. I think games, you are a trespasser. And I think you're incredibly mercenary. And I think you've been playing around with us, and I've had enough. Well, fine. I am asking you to please leave and I will speak with you with Mr. Glazier, period. I don't like coming home after hard days doing stuff and having cameras on you. This you has gone on forever. We pay, a, we've paid you. I have not gotten I that. You, we gave you $1,250 the last time we were here. You didn't get that? It was given to Steve Glazer who put it in your hand. We filmed us giving I, it to you. I, now, this is the fifth time I have counted. I am asking to turn off the cameras. You did are we trespassing. Did we not give you the money? I'm not speaking anymore. I've been waiting so long. I've been waiting so long. Lee has finally I've agreed to see us, and so Steve is coming too to make sure we get in. Be where I'm going in the sunshine of your life. Nineteen sixty seven and the hits keep rolling on WWW spinning stacks of wax back to back. Pardon me, I, I didn't get there. All right. Yep. Will, will you let me know when she is? Okay. Hey, you don't have any secret cameras in, in your uh, belt, do you? No, oh, no. I just have this rather large one right here.
Hi, how you doing? Sorry about the delay, but no. when I just got from trial, there was no way. I mean, right after trial, uh, uh, I mean, after the hearing and everything, you know. Uh, after the hearing and the court. Yeah, oh, where I was at Pasco. Uh huh. Yeah. So, it's been a struggle to uh, actually see you. I know. Yeah. Um, is it, uh, did you have any problems with Arlene? With Arlene? Yeah. It's been a little tough going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you know that we had? Yeah, she told me about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I said a couple of things to Arlene. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I hope you got all the money and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That came through. So. As long as I get their share and everything, that's all right. I don't care about the money. All I care about is the crooked cops. Well, one one of the questions I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you was why, in a <coughs> sense, you, you, why the money, in a sense, is important to you. Because you can't, how much can you spend here a month? Not very much, and uh, the money is not. But it right. seems like it might be to you people. No, I was just wondering if, I mean, because presumably most of it goes to Arlene or Steve or... Yeah. Arlene and Steve seem to be the money hungry people, yes. Because and I have, I'm having a problem with Arlene and Steve, and I do believe that's their purpose, their main purpose. And I, I do believe it's their main purpose to see me die. Because I have to be honest with you, I told Arlene I thought she was very mercenary. That's what the bottom of our argument was. Did you pay them more than 10000 No. Okay, I wanted to make sure on that too, because I don't believe them. I, I have uh, my doubts about Arlene and Steve. I believe that Arlene and Steve are... I have a problem. I can't discuss it right now, especially on camera. Yeah. I mean... It, it Arlene did not adopt me to be my mother. She adopted me to bury me, and she adopted me just to visit, and have easier access to visitation. And, there, and, and she's doing a lot of... Steve is doing a lot of in the media, and so is Arlene. And they're both really pissing me off because I think their motive was just to make money. I can't, I just can't go any further than that. <laughs> Cause, uh, I'll do it later, just before I go or something. Well, how much <laughs> did they have to do with you changing your defense as well? Hmm? To do with you changing your They did it. They convinced me. Mm -hmm. They convinced me. For you to, to not contest your... Um, I'll give you an example, and this is what's really pissing me off, is... Um, when they wanted me to plead no contest, Steve did, and Arlene, Arlene started it, I think, and Steve just kind of fell in. But Arlene kept saying, why don't you plead guilty, you know, don't go through all these trials. I can't take it anymore, all, all these trials. She couldn't take it anymore. She, yeah. And, um, and you know, your mother, you're killing your new mo adopted mom now with these trials and stuff. And if you don't go to the, to the trials, the, the cops won't have anything for the movie. And, it, and I, yeah, and I found out that it didn't matter because the day that I pleaded no contest to Marion, there was a big write-up in the front page about the cops doing their movie anyway. So it didn't make a difference. I already, too late, I already said it. So and why are you thinking, <coughs> why, I mean, I know... In a I, because... <laughs> They convinced me that the cops would not be able to do their movie, have any access to this movie, because they needed the trials to go through. But do, why do you think Arlene and Steve would want you to be guilty? Arlene and Steve have both suggested how I could kill myself. That's not very motherly, is it? <laughs> well, kill yourself while you're in, the, in this institution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they both suggested it. It's not very motherly nor very lawyerly, is it? And even giving me some ideas. So that's pretty sick. Mm -hmm. I know they're, they're not on my side. But it's too late. Now all I need to do is slide through the rest of these stupid trials, Pasco Dixon, Dixie, find me a real good detective and a real good investigative reporter to go out and figure out what's going on uh, with 
find out that I'm telling the truth and they're lying and find the evidence. And once you've got evidence, I can get a new trial and I need to go to a new trial through the Supreme Court. And what about before all this happened? Did you... You mean before the crimes themselves? Yeah. I was doing fine until Tyra told me to start going to see strangers and make more money. That's how I wound up in this situation. But hadn't you been, but you'd been working as a prostitute for a while before then, hadn't you? I was doing real good monetarily, yeah. I was making hand over fist of money. I was doing real good. The only thing, the only problem that happened is when Saudi Arabia came in, all my clients started going to Desert Storm and going to the bases and training and getting ready to go overseas and do that deal in Kuwait. And so I lost a lot of my regulars and Tyra told me, well, why don't you go out there and do your strangers again like you did from the beginning when I started hooking. And I thought, you know, I can deal with my, stra my regulars I have now. I only make about 100, 150 a week. Did Ty you feel that Tyra was into it for But Tyra money wanted me to well. bring in 700 or 1,000 a week. What? Did you feel Tyra was into it for money as well? Well, now I look at it, yes, definitely. She was, she, was, she was using me monetarily. So was my first lover before Tyra. I bought her a pressure cleaning business and everything, and she took off two months after I bought it for her. And now Steve and Arlene as well. Everybody. Well, why do you just, think? They must be the economy, man. Why do you People think? Just, Everybody seems like they just care about the money. They don't care about me. Eileen Warren has killed seven people. She deserves to die. Who gives a darn? Let's make some money and forget about her. But that's not the point. It's a, I say it's this. The principle is self-defense. They say it's number. I say it's principle. The heck with what... It, it, it has nothing to do with the number killed. It's the principle. But they're saying if there is a number... No, self-defense is self-defense no matter how many times it is. I don't care if it's a hundred times. I was very, I never provoked those guys. I never provoked them. I never showed any provocations whatsoever. It was very nice, very decent, very clean, very ladylike. I didn't even swear in front of my clients. And a lot of my clients, I talked about Jesus and I talked political, both mixed together and we never argued. So there was no provocation whatsoever. There was no need for them to look for the closest weapon in the vehicle and try to use it on me to rape me. Two did, five tried. How, how Are you guys long? ready for me? Do you, do you want to, three minutes, do you want to? Two or three more minutes. Okay. Do you want to break any more? <laughs> so what are you guys going to do? Are you going to uh, try to investigate some of this? Yeah, we will. If you guys can look for the Republican pictures, the contract. I just got 487 to figure out. I can't just get on. You've got it right there. If you can find it, that will set me a new trial for the Supreme Court. Wow. The Republic pictures. Yeah, Republican pictures. That's where they're working at. Overkill movie. If you can find the contract, they're they're dead meat. Well, you're saying <laughs> you're saying that they wanted to. They set the. This section office. is being covered by this voiceover because of potential legal problems that might otherwise arise, as with the bleep section that is to follow. Made up in their mind. She's a serial killer. We're going to, even if she's innocent, I, we don't care. We're going to make the public believe she's a serial killer. But anyway, that's what you said, the said that you're gonna, two things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to get the public to believe that she's a serial killer, and you're going to have to get her convicted in order to get this movie to go. We're going to be in Ocala over the next couple of days. And we'll try and ask the police their involvement in it. Good. And then we'll come back and see you again on Tuesday. Great, because see, we tried to contact the police officers Lee mentioned, but they declined comment. Okay. The state attorney's report concluded there had been no exchange of contracts or money between the police and Republic Pitchers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care of yourself. I hope to see you soon. When we returned for our Tuesday meeting with Lee Warnos, the prison informed us we were no longer welcome. They cited our previous security violation. Maybe I'll look better next time. I'm getting my commissary today, some mascara and a brush. Shortly after we left, it was discovered that Richard Mallory, Lee Warnos' first victim, had spent 10 years in an institution for attempted rape.
Should there be an appeal, Steve Glazer will not be in charge of the case. Several months after we left, the Hollywood movie discussions reportedly caught up with the police. Sergeant Munster and Captain Binniger have both been transferred out of the Criminal Investigation Division. And here, Sheriff Morland is announcing the resignation of Major Dan Henry following the bug phone conversation he had about the Warnos movie deals. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is one of the most unpleasant things I've ever had to do. And I'll read to you a, a release. On November the 10th, 1992, Major Dan Henry resigned as Chief of Staff of the Marion County Sheriff's Office after being notified of an investigation being conducted by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The investigation was requested by Sheriff Don Moreland and Sheriff-elect Ken Ergel after information was received by the Sheriff's Office from Attorney Bill DeCarlis in behalf of his client, Deputy Bruce Munster. The investigation being conducted by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement centers around tape telephone conversations made by Deputy Munster between he and Major Henry involving the Eileen Warnos case. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement There's speculation that if it is found the officers did receive money, all Lee Warnos' death sentences could be overturned. <laughs> 